Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. The audiobook we're talking about now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable tells the story of some peaceful creatures whose lives are upended by an intruder. It's titled Furry Tales, The Village Would Be the Same. It's written by Pam Tennis Lord, and we're going to talk all about this audio book. Pam is here with me now. Pam, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Oh, thank you. Can you tell me all about Furry Tales, The Village Would Be the Same? What can readers and listeners, in this case with the audiobook, expect here? Well, I hope that they get intrigued by the adventure and the friendship and the inclusion and the camaraderie and the scariness of having a critter that they don't know about come in among their midst. I like the message that you're sharing here because it's about making friends and accepting others who might be a little bit different than you. And, and that's fantastic, Pam. Hey there. We're the special needs granddaughter. And it turns out that people look at her differently, mm. and they don't take the time to get to know her. They make assumptions. They show interest, or they back off. And I just felt that we need to look at people as individuals. Mm. And I wanted kids to realize that everybody is different, and that's a good thing. Mm. And we should accept that and get to know people. Pam, did you have a specific group of readers in mind that you were writing this for, maybe an age range or a certain audience? Well, interestingly enough, it didn't start out that way, because this is the second book in my series of three. And the first one was to introduce friendship and inclusion and acceptance and the ecology, and I was saying, so who's your target audience? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. It wasn't what encouraged me to write the book in the first place. And as I talked to more people, they kind of informed me that they thought it was for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade readers. Then I've also had adults tell me that they've read it and they think everybody should read it. Pam, did Furry Tales take you a long time to do or did it go through the whole process pretty quickly for you? I never intended to write a book. I have a vivid imagination and I love nature. And I was looking at the squirrel's nest high in the trees and it amazed me that the squirrels never put their nests in the same place in the tree. Some of them were on very high up, so I got thinking, what happens during a really bad windstorm? Doesn't it blow the nest out? So in my imagination, I saw a squirrel in there hanging on and going, Yahoo! he was rubbing the fact that he was being tossed by the wind. <laughs> I love it. That kind of grabbed my imagination, and I just started writing. And I'd wake up at two and think, oh, I got to write that down. I'll forget it if I don't. And the next thing I knew, it was a book. There was a total surprise, but friends thought that I had a lot to say and it was important for kids. So the second book hadn't really come to me, except someone said, well, you realize you left the first book open for a second book. And I said, no, I didn't. They said, no, you did. <laughs> so I reread the last couple of chapters and thought, holy cow, I can make this work. And that's how I got into the second book. Part of it, it still involves friendship, inclusion, acceptance, the ecology. And then because I am in my late 70s, I can no longer do what I used to do with age. Age, I meant to say. So... I threw in the process of aging and how that affects what we can do and what we can't do. Again, this audiobook is titled Furry Tales, The Village Would Be the Same. 
It's written by Pam Tennis Lord and published by the Audiobook Network, so of course you can get it anywhere that you pick up your audiobooks. Go on over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon. You'll be able to pick this one up. Well, Pam, thanks so much for coming on the show and telling me all about this work. I had a nice time with you tonight. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. The Wisest Virgin. That's the name of the new book. It just hit stores, written by Tata D. Mdushi. And I get to find out all about this book. Tata is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Tata, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. It's my pleasure. Tata, can you tell me all about The Wisest Virgin? What can readers expect here? Oh, yes. So The Wisest Virgin is a story about a young girl called Jessica. Jessica happens to be born out of wedlock. Her mom is in college and then she gets pregnant and she's born. So she doesn't get to know her dad. And so for that reason, she grows with this resentment for her dad. And then it translates to resentment for all men because she believes that every man out there is just like her father who did not care about her. And this then leads her to aspire to be a lawyer in the future. So she can fight for women because she believes all men are bad and she should put all men in jail. But then something changes about her because she gets to somewhere between seventh and eighth grade. She meets a man, a guy, a young guy out of high school who becomes her teacher and her mentor. And this guy helps her to see life from a different perspective because he gets to See in this person, like men are not the same. What she thought about men might not necessarily be true. But then she's still wrestling with the idea of, do I trust men? If this guy looks like he's different from my dad, do I get to trust him? But at the end of the day, she gets to be mentored by this guy who becomes kind of a father figure, even though he's a young guy. And at the end of the book, Jessica finally gets married to this guy, which is interesting because her perspective changes from being that lawyer, that feminist lawyer who is going to fight against every man to getting together with this guy and having a different mission in life, which is to be a mentor to other young people, just like she was mentored by this guy. And she got to you know, change her perspective and get to understand life from a different vantage point. Tata, where did the inspiration or the idea for this book come from? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Because out of high school, I happen to... So the inspiration for this book actually comes from the story that I kind of happened to experience. Because out of high school, I took a job as a part-time teacher because there was a kind of teacher shortage in Cameroon. That's in West Africa where it comes from. Mm. And I had the opportunity to mentor from young people just to help them see life from a different perspective. And one of those people happened to be my wife. Hmm. And so I ended up getting married. And so it was kind of, I would say, the inspiration comes from her story because years down the line, when I get to talk to those people and they get to share how that interaction that we have for the short time that I was there, how it was kind of influential in their life, that became an inspiration for me to put the story down. Hmm. Tata, what are the chances that we're going to be seeing more published by you in the future? <laughs> yes, Corey, that's a good question. So having the first book, it was kind of an inspiration for me and kind of a validation of potential mm. to tell me, hey, there is more that you could do because English is my second language, actually. I learned English in school because I grew up in Cameroon in West Africa and I just learned English in school and my first language is a different language. Wow. And so having to write the story in English and have it published in America, for me, is a big validation. And it is just telling me, hey, there is more. Thinking, okay, maybe in the next two years, I should be able to publish the second book and maybe the third and keep going. So it's been a dream of mine and I'm sure I should do more. Well, I think readers are going to really love this book. I, I encourage my listeners right now to seek this title out. Again, it's The Wisest Virgin. It's written by Tata D. Mjushi, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. So you can get it everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Tata, it's been really wonderful having you on the show and learning all about The Wisest Virgin and everything you got going on. Thanks again for your time. The pleasure to be mine. Thank you so much, Corey, for having me. 
Sitting down right beside me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Nellie Robles. Nellie, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks for having me. The pleasure is all mine. I just wanted to say congratulations. You got a new book out titled Broken to Beautiful, and this tells truly an extraordinary story, Nellie. Can you tell everybody about it? Sure. I wrote it. It's about my life. It's how I grew up and how my addiction, my brokenness, all led me to into the arms of Jesus Christ. That's pretty much what it is. I wasn't looking for him. He found me in in a very dark place, homeless, living in my car, and here I am, a miracle. Nellie, what inspired you, gave you that idea to write this story and publish it? I was at a Dolan Teen Challenge for a year, and while I was there, I had it in my heart to share my story with everyone else. I know I'm not the only one who has gone through dark times. So when I went to ministry one time, I met someone who told me about Christian Faith Publishing, and I knew that was a sign. So when I graduated, I ended up going through all my journals and writing about what really was on my heart to write. Have you ever done anything like this before? Have you ever written or been published or anything like that? Not at all. This was my first time. <laughs> wow, congratulations. How long did this take you to do, Nellie? It took me about a month, a lot of fasting and praying. There was a lot of hard times that I wrote about that was hard for me to type. So it took me a lot of praying and typing. But mm. yeah, I I shared it. And now that you've been through all of that, Nelly, is there any advice now that you have for people who are in the same spot that you were? They're going to write a book, they haven't done it yet, and they're about to go through all of that. What would you tell them? I would say... Definitely go for it. Let your heart just lead to what you're wanting to share with the world. Nothing is impossible. And I believe that, you know, what is in our heart is special and others need to hear it. Great advice. Now, this book is something really personal to you, very special to you. So you got to tell me about that moment when you open your mailbox and there it is, finally, your first copy of Broken to Beautiful. You get to hold it. What was that like, Nellie? I thought, wow, now everyone's going to know what I've been through. Mm. But this is exciting because I just thought, man, I'm going to hopefully help another woman out there that has been through something. She's not alone. We're here to lift each other up. When it came to the publishing process and everything that's involved in that, Nelly, what did you find to be the most challenging part of all that? Waiting patiently. Mm. <laughs> I know it's a process, but just trusting the process. What are the chances that you'll write more and maybe consider publishing more in the future? There is definitely a chance. I already have something in my heart that I would love to write about. Is it more along the lines of things like this, things that you've experienced and you're helping people with, or you go in a different direction? I believe that it's something, yes, that could help other people. Really um, going in that direction. Just wanting to share even now my experiences. I just got married. And oh, congratulations. Thank you. Things that, you know, we've been through already that has, you know, that I would love to share with other couples. Mm. Nellie, were there people alongside you along the way while you were writing this, taking this on, and they could kind of be there to cheer you on or maybe encourage and motivate you? Yes, my parents. My parents were there. They saw me from when I was in my addiction and everything, and they definitely supported me, especially because they saw the transformation. They knew that I had a story to tell. A lot of times when you're driven to write a lot, it also means you like to read, Nellie. Is that you? What kind of a reader are you? I do. I do like to read. I like to learn more about things I'm going through instead of just writing about it and not knowing anything about it. I would like to gain knowledge and, okay, I'm going through this. This, this is going to help me share with someone else how I went through it and what got me through. I know a lot of people are going to find comfort and help in the pages of this book. Again, it's titled Broken to Beautiful. It's written by Nellie Robles and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So get it anywhere, get it on Amazon, get it at Barnes & Noble, get it on iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, everywhere. Nelly, thank you again for coming on the Reader House Author Roundtable and tell me about your story and about this book. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you for having me. Toymaker's Intrigue. That's the name of the new book, written by John P. Mullen. 
And I'm really curious about this one. It's in stores now, and John's here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. I get to find out all about this. John, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. I appreciate your time, John. I'm really curious about Toymaker's Intrigue. Can you tell me about this? Yeah, absolutely. So Toymaker's Intrigue is an interdimensional fantasy adventure and mystery. Unpack that. <laughs> it's told from the viewpoint of five characters. Chief of Colm is Tiamat Gindel, and Tiam finds himself overqualified for a role employed by the Jason Ganim Company, who's an outfit that committed to hunting antiquities and a thing called Sarah Crystals, which we talk a lot about in the story. And Sarah Crystals, they're, they're mineral only forms when two dimensions collide. So he had done everything he possibly could to make himself the right-hand man of Jason Ganim. And like so many times in life, you get there, but not quite. And he finds himself at the bottom of the pile in the company. And he's quite frustrated, which is how the story starts out. As the adventure goes on, he gets pulled into greater and greater importance, sometimes by chance or maybe not so much chance. And that sort of presents the intrigue and really highlights the central theme of the book is really around trying to understand purpose. You got to tell me, John, where did the idea, the inspiration for this come from? So a lot of it came from personal life experiences. Visualizing myself as a young man, read a lot as a young man, I've always been enamored with hero characters and really kind of committed to that in all things that I do, whether it was sport growing up or at school, family, friends. And sometimes things work, and sometimes, man, they really just don't. In 2018, I, I got slammed with a neurologic setback, and this became a venue for me to sort of share my thoughts and sort of the random nature of things that the, the book presents coming into something that is, is pinpoint clear sort of guided the book as it went. I had characters in mind that I had baked for years and years, and they all came together to make the story, and, and really it just came together. Is there going to be a follow-up, do you think, or another book in the future? There it is. All right. No, there absolutely is. It's under construction right now. I'm hoping to be done with my, uh, I don't like to call it a rough draft, the working draft by Christmas, and then have it tailored and tuned to send out to publication in the spring. When it comes to Toymaker's Intrigue, had you written anything before that, been published before that, or was this your first one? So this is my first publication. It's not my first writing. I actually have files and files and files of snippets, excerpts, and short stories that I've constructed over the years, but never really had the nerve to put it out there. I think I was a little intimidated. I went to a writer's workshop in Boston and got to meet some people. And that sort of pushed me into creating a little bit of copy to review. And I got a lot of encouragement from that. And so I went from there and wrapped it up and put it out there. John, I love the cover of this book. You got to tell me about it. How did that come together? Well, that's very cool that you said that. And I'll tell you why. So the cover to the book is, it ties into the story. And the story they talk often about the wandering. And again, it's sort of a play on words. The wandering is sort of the space between dimensions. It's a timeless space and it's chaos. And on the front cover, you have the protagonist becoming the wandering. And that really ties into the story. But the artist who did it is one of the most fabulous artists in the world and is an unknown. And her name is Julie Mullen. And she's my mother. Oh, wow. I gave her the concept on a few short words on a text, and she rendered exactly what was in my head. It was a special thing for me to do with my mother. She's a hidden gem of a talent. She's done a lot of great things, and it was neat to have her be a part of this with me. I think a lot of people will be into this book. I encourage everybody listening to definitely go check this one out. Again, it's called Toymaker's Intrigue. It's written by John P. Mullen, and it's published by Haas and Jenkins Publishing, so you can get it everywhere, like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores everywhere. John, thanks again for coming on and telling me about this really interesting book. I had a nice time talking with you. Hey, you too, Corey. I really appreciate it, and I uh, hope everybody out there enjoys it. 
There's a new audio book. It just hit stores. It's titled Beta's Year of Firsts. It's written by Lois Jean Lee, and I'm going to find out all about this audio book. The author, Lois, is here with me now at the Raider House Author Roundtable. Lois, welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me, Corey. Well, the pleasure's all mine, Lois. Can you tell me all about Beta's Year of Firsts? Sure. It starts out with a 12-year-old girl sitting in the hospital next to her mother's hospital bed. Her mother is dying. You never find out what her illness was. And her mother dies while Bay is holding her hand. And her mother stares off into space as if she's thinking about what she's going to say next. The book goes on to tell about Bay's life the first year after her mother dies and all the things she goes through. There's a lot of things that happen in the book there. I want to keep it as a surprise. But you find out something about her name. You find out something about her father, people that she's met. And all the things that she has planned in order to keep the fact that her mother has died out of the knowledge of the social worker that she does not like. She's not a very nice social worker. She doesn't have any empathy for Beta. She goes into a foster family, which she ends up loving. The mother is just like her mother. She can talk to her, tell her what's going on in school, and she feels very comfortable. And during the first part of the book, Beta hears things that her mother used to tell her, just about like being nice to people and obeying people. And she hears it in her head, and she'll think she sees her mother like when they go back to the apartment when she's getting her things to move out. She wishes her mother would be there, and her thought is always that if I had taken care of my mother better, she'd still be alive. She's so sure that she didn't take good enough care of her, which is not true. She mm. did the best she could have done, seeing that she's only 12 years old. Mm. And it just goes through all the holidays, her birthday. She has a best friend named Tessa that they go to the library every Saturday. And I fell in love with her when I was writing the book. And I'm hoping that when people read the book, they'll fall in love with her mm. because she's a sweet little girl. And she minds her mother. She loved her mother. And I want the book to let kids her age know that it's okay to be nice to your parents and to love your parents and to mind them and do things that they want for them to do and that they don't need to be nasty or anything like that. Lois, when you think about the readers that you were writing for here, who is that? Well, when I was writing the book, it was for middle grade girls. But when it came out, I had a lot of my friends read the book. They were all adults, and they liked it just as much as the younger kids did. Oh, wow. So it's meant for anybody, like, probably from 10 up. They can read it and enjoy it. It's not hard reading. I felt like it was a page turner. The wording in it isn't hard for younger children, like 10-year-olds, to read it. They don't, and they're not going to have to worry about that. There's no sex in it. There's no swearing in it. And I think anybody that enjoys reading, even if you're not a reader, I think you'll really enjoy reading it. I had one person that, a girl, that she said she wasn't a reader. And she read my book and she said, I, I love reading now because oh, wow. of your book. And I felt really good about that because that's what I wanted the book to do. I wanted it to be a page turner and I wanted people to enjoy it and fall in love with this little girl like I did. How long of a process was this for you, Lois, from when you first started writing it clear up until it was published? It took me about 10 years, and that was because I was doing all kinds of reviews. I sent it into different publishers along the way, and nobody wanted it. And I think they didn't want it because she was such a nice little girl. And as I said, there's no swearing, there's no sex, and she's just a nice little girl. But I would read it over again, and I would tweak it. I would change just even a word. I would change a word to make it sound even better than it was. That's why it took me so long, because I wanted it to be a perfect book. Well, I know a lot of children and adults are really going to be into this audio book, and I encourage those listening to go seek this one out. Again, it's titled Beta's Year of Firsts. It's written by Lois Jean Lee, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so you can get it on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store, Amazon, everywhere you pick up your audiobooks. Lois, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me about Beta's Year of Firsts. I had a really nice time. I had a good time too, Corey. I hope I encouraged people to go out there and read it. I think people will like it when they read it. 
The book we're going to talk about now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable addresses a serious issue that's pervasive in so many aspects of our lives. It's titled Violence Prevention. We Can All Help. This is written by John Fries, and John is here with me now. We get to talk all about this book. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. John, can you tell us all about violence prevention? What can readers expect when they open this one up? Well, the first chapter talks about the cost of violence. The cost is estimated worldwide to be about $14 trillion a year. Then the next chapter talks about the causes of violence. There are a couple of things that typically cause somebody to be violent. One might be a conflict or disagreement that people have, and they fail to solve it peacefully. Most people can solve a conflict peacefully. Most of us have conflicts here and now through our lives. But some people have not learned how to do that without resorting to violence. Mm. Another thing that can cause violence is some kind of event happens that causes a person to feel insulted or disrespected or frightened or angry or feeling like something's about to be taken away from him that he treasures. And most of us can deal with that sort of thing without violence. But some people have an underlying condition that causes them to have more likelihood of responding violently to a triggering condition like that. So several chapters in the book deal with things that all of us can do to prevent violence, whether it's violence in the home or on the streets or terrorism or wars or suicide. There are things that each of us can do to help prevent violence. Hmm. What was the inspiration, John, for you to sit down and start writing this book, get this thing published? Well, when the World Trade Center was attacked and the United States invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, I started doing research to try to understand the causes of terrorism and the causes of war. And as I looked into that, after a while, I began to realize that I wanted to expand my interest to include all kinds of violence, because I saw in the news every day about people being shot or people committing suicide or people getting into other kinds of violent situations. And I decided to expand my research. And the more I looked into it, the more I began to realize that the same principles can be applied to prevent violence of any kind, whether it's on the streets or in the home or terrorism or suicide or wars. So once I discovered that, I felt like that was something I wanted to share with other people. And I decided the best way to share it was through a book. Hmm. Now, John, is this your first foray into the world of writing and publishing, or have you done this before? It's my first book. I have done a lot of writing of different kinds, but this is my first book. Congratulations, John. Uh, how long did this take you to put through the whole writing process and get it out there? Well, the research took the most time. Mm. Like I mentioned, I started when the train center was attacked, and I have been looking into this situation and doing research, reading a lot, and looking on the internet and talking with people. And I've been giving people drafts of what I wrote and learning from things they had to say about it, which expanded my understanding and caused me to look in other directions. So it took about 20 years altogether before I had something that I thought was finished enough so that it might be appropriate to go ahead and share it with other people broadly. So this book was decades in the making. So after all that time, all that hard work that you put into this, John, what was that moment like when you got that first copy and you got to hold this book for the first time? What were you thinking and feeling? Well, it was sort of like when you pass a test in school. It was just a sense of satisfaction that things are working out. And now that you've done this for the first time, it can be quite the learning experience. Do you have advice now that you could throw out there for the aspiring authors? Sure. One of the things that helped me the most was sharing my draft with other people and learning from what they had to say as they looked at it. And then the other piece of advice, I really would recommend Ewan Springs Publishing. Mm. They did a wonderful job leading me through the process and helping with each step along the way. Well, this book has an important message, and I encourage everybody listening right now to definitely go check this out. Again, it's titled Violence Prevention. We All Can Help. It's written by John Fries and is published by Newman Springs Publishing. So, of course, you can get it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, or traditional brick-and-mortar stores. John, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about this work. I had a nice time chatting with you. Well, I enjoyed it, too. Thank you for your help. The Nature of Relationships, A Question of Self, Other, God. 
This is a new book in stores written by Daniel Bryant, and we're going to talk all about this book here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Dan is right here with me. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you, Dan. Especially, I'm curious about the nature of relationships. Can you tell me what's in this book? Well, there are really a number of things. It really, I believe that religion, faith, is a relationship. It's a relationship with God, but it's also a relationship with God through other people and with self. So that accounts for the title. I started it out as kind of a self-discovery since uh, religion was an important part of my life, all my life, and uh, discovered a great deal about myself and, and my relationships. And then I wrote it for my children so that they might know who I am and some of the foundations of the thinking that I shared with them. And then all the family for others so that they might be free to think about their relationships. I kind of believe that faith is collaborative and involves from discussion. Dogma is a guide to discussion, but it's not the end of it. So that's kind of what led to the book. Hmm. Have you ever done anything like this before, Dan, written or been published? Not since college, and that was a long, long time ago. I've read for work in my life and uh, written letters and things. But no, this is the first time I've written a book, but it is not like permitting the last time that I'll do so. How long did this take you to write and publish, Dan? I had an occasion occur in life, which we were all subjected to, called the pandemic. So I had the time to write. So I just sat down and did it every day. I imagine the endeavor took me probably a half to three quarters of a year. And then a good deal more to do the editing and correcting and the like. I think what I discovered is that all religions embody a couple of characteristics. There's space for the development of an individual spirituality mind. And it's also very institutional. And the institutional is a wonderful conduit for the wisdom that's come from the ages. And so it's both an impetus to discussion, but it's an impediment to change that institutional part of it. I was interested. God's become so institutional or sanctified over time, and I don't mean to make light of that, that I think we lost some of his humanity. So my intent was to begin and present God as something human for all people so that they can better relate. Now, I, I have God being if, and I'm not so inane as to believe that I have the definitive explanation of who he, she is, but it's equally inane to assume that I can have no insight on my or our creator, and that's the same for all the people. That, that's kind of what this is. It started out, and I think it might have been better written as two books, one for children, because it goes into its life early on, and one that involves a little more of the theological kinds of questions. Hmm. Dan, what was that moment like whenever you finally got your first copy in and you got to hold your book for the first time? What was that like? Well, I think when I got the first copy, I got it to edit it line by line. And if anybody who's done this know, it was a most <laughs> of grief and woe and wondering, what did I get myself into? <laughs> so I, I don't know that. I think I would completed much of what I wanted by the time I got the first copy. And it, it took me a while to get grips on it and uh, have a sense of comfort and a sense of excitement that I'd done it, that I'd been able to put it down on paper. I think a lot of people will be enlightened and blessed by this book, and I encourage those listening to go seek this out. Again, the title is The Nature of Relationships, A Question of Self, Other, God. It's written by Daniel Bryant and published by Covenant Books. So, of course, you can get it anywhere. Go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores. You'll be able to pick this book up. Dan, thanks again for coming on the show, telling me about your work, and everything else that you got going on. I really appreciate it. Well, and I appreciate the opportunity to share the book with you and your audience. Thank you. The Seventh Wonder, a novel. It's the new book, Just Hit Stores, written by May Lamar. And we get to talk all about this book here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
May is joining me now. May, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. May, can you tell me all about The Seventh Wonder, a novel? What's this all about? I can't tell you all about it, but I can tell you it's a story set in 1971 at the Southern Girls Summer Camp, and a army brat with a lot of problems is dumped there by her semi-evil stepmother, and on the same day, she dumps the girl's dog nearby in the woods, and I just take it from there. Did you have a certain group of readers that you were writing for here, May? Yeah, my generation. I was born in 57 and grew up in the 70s and kind of in the 80s. The music and the genre and the story, I think, is relatable to women, let's say, past 40. And what was your inspiration to sit down and get started on this book, May? Let's see. Oh, how many years? 12 years at a summer camp, another four years at another summer camp. Just experiencing summer camp and the dynamics that help motivate people in the summer, the fractional times when you spend at camp and how friendships are developed and what friendship really means. Hmm. When it comes to writing and publishing May, is this your first time or have you done this kind of thing before? Well, our first book, my husband is also a writer, was published through Taylor Publishing in 86. It's kind of a cult classic. It's about hunting. But I've published several novels through the Don L. Group, and we do novels for people who have accomplished much and would like to tell their stories, like inventors and captains of industry and stuff. So, no, this is not my first book. I've been writing since I was about, I think I started at Bear School for their newsletter, and then in high school I wrote for the Trinity Paw, and in college I wrote for the Crimson and White, and then I got a job with the Gastonia Gazette. That was my first newspaper job. So I've been around a while. So how long does a novel like The Seventh Wonder take you to write? I think it took me about 40 years. And you're quite a veteran, obviously, May. So what advice would you have to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? Don't get discouraged. You know, when New York turns you down, when the agents are too busy to take your stuff and you get these form letters and you get these form letters and you get these form letters and you've spent two or three years writing something, don't give up. Find another way to get it published, man. Find another way. You'll find an audience if your stuff is good. But my best advice is write a good book. Does it ever get old for you, May, that moment when you open up your mailbox and you finally get the first copy of that book that you've been working on for so long? What was it like, for instance, The Seventh Wonder, when that one, you got to hold that one, what was that like? I loved what Covenant did with the cover. I loved the cover. I really did. And I've done a lot of covers in my life. I was also a copywriter and a communicator for several companies and stuff. That cover is really good, and I love it. And it kind of just brings you in. And so my hat's off to that graphic artist that did that cover. Now, if I were a gambling man, May, I'd put money on that you're going to be writing more in the future. Would I be right? You'd be right. Do you have anything planned, or are you just sort of formulating ideas? Well, I came up through the old school newspaper, and I'm going to probably write a story about old school newspapers, which were family-owned and not corporately owned, Hmm. and how that was, and coming up through when the computers came in, and how that messed with everybody's mind, you know, and going from hard copy to digital copy, and just how that was, because I was there when it happened. Well, I think readers of all kinds are really going to be into this book. I encourage my listeners to check it out. Again, the title is The Seventh Wonder, a novel. It's written by May Lamar, published by Covenant Books. You can find it anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. May, thank you again for joining me and telling me about your work and everything that you've done. I had a nice time talking with you. I've had a great time talking with you, too. Thank you so much. Sitting down right beside me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm joined by author Vernon R. Gross. Vernon, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm really glad you're here. You got a new book out, A Year's Journey from a Pastor's Perspective. Vernon, can you tell me all about it? Yes, sir. I started writing this devotional, A Year's Devotional book, and 
I guess the motivation originally was basically for my kids and my grandkids to leave a legacy behind so that when I'm gone, you know, the ministry would continue. But since then, I've gotten quite a bit of interest from other people that have looked at it and people that I've pastored has gotten it and family members of mine and family members of my wife. And I just hope and pray that it'll be a blessing. Hmm. Vernon, who did you write these devotions for? Did you have a certain group of people? Again, my motivation was in the originally was for my kids and my grandkids. I wanted a devotional that dealt more with than just cliches and pretty sayings, and and they have their place, and I enjoy them. They're a blessing, but I wanted something that dealt with everyday issues like bitterness, hurt, loss, forgiveness, the things that we as believers encounter. Have you ever done anything like this before, Vernon, written, published, anything like that? No, I have not written a book before. Now I'm involved in something else now in another writing project, but this was my first one. Hmm. Congratulations. Thank Did you, it take sir. you a while to write and put through that publishing process? It took me a year to write it. I moved to Liberty, Mississippi, where I live and pastor a church, and we've been pastoring, my wife and I, for about 40 years. Oh, wow. And we came here, and I have more time for some reason here, and I've been wanting to do it for years. And, and after I came here and I realized the time I had, I just began to think about something I've been wanting to do, and I finally have time to do it. And I just felt like the Lord impressing me to, that now is the time. And I started writing, and it took me a full year to write it. When it came to the publishing end of things, there's so much involved in that, Vernon. What did you find the most challenging part of that end? Well, I called Christian Faith Publishing, and they worked with me. I mean, they walked me through the process. It was something that I wasn't familiar with. I do have some friends, pastor friends, that have books that are published, and, you know, I've got advice from them. But when I contacted Christian Faith Publishing, they walked me through it, and it was a great help to me. Fantastic. And I could only imagine that moment when you open up your mailbox and there's your first copy. Vernon, what was that moment like for you? Oh, man, that was... It brought tears to my eyes, actually. Mm. I wasn't a good student growing up. I wasn't a Christian, and, and I was raised in Los Angeles, and I never dreamed that I would be doing anything like this. And, and the people that I grew up with, I don't think, ever thought it would happen either, but it thrilled me beyond measure. What do you think the chances are that we'll be seeing more books from you in the future, Vernon? Well, like I said, I'm involved now in the process of writing. I'm going, it's not a devotional, it is a commentary and more in-depth commentary from the book of Acts. I'm taking one to a few verses at a time going through the entire book, and it'll be several volumes. I'm almost done with volume one. It'll be chapters one through four will be one volume, and I'm almost done with it. I'm sure you picked up a lot along the way of writing and publishing, Vernon. Uh, what advice would you have for the aspiring authors, the first-time authors that are listening? Well, I'd, I would say season what you do with prayer and uh, make sure it's scripturally sound. And if it is, it'll be a blessing because the Word doesn't return void. You know, and when you begin writing a book, it's going to take a commitment. You know, you're going to put your heart and soul in it and get down to business and just dedicate yourself to the task. And if you do, it, the more you do it, the more you'll get involved in it and the more you'll love it. You know, we all write, we all get published for a lot of different reasons. Uh, Vernon, for you, what's the most rewarding aspect of being a published author? Just the thought that when I'm gone, my ministry will continue. Mm -hmm. You know, that there will be people continuing to be blessed by what God has given me. Vernon, when you write, do you have a certain time of day that you like to do it, maybe early in the morning or late at night, or do you find yourself just writing whenever you can fit it into your schedule? No, sir. I get up at 5 o'clock every morning, and my wife usually sleeps till 7.38. And when I get up in the morning and I spend my time in prayer, the scripture for myself, and then I immediately, that's when I like to write, when it's quiet and there ain't nobody else there. Again, it's titled, A Year's Journey from a Pastor's Perspective. It's written by Vernon R. Gross, published by Christian Faith Publishing, so it's available anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Thank you again, Vernon, for coming on the show and telling me all about this book. I had a really nice time talking with you. I appreciate you calling me. Thank you, sir. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm excited to welcome author Ronald Barrett. Ronald, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. It's so exciting. Wanted to congratulate you on getting a new book out there titled Sailing into Salvation. 
run. Can you tell me all about it? Yeah, there's two concepts that I kind of focus on. One is the fact that getting home from war and that kind of thing is, isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. Mm. So I focus on that, but I also focus on my faith and my belief in Jesus Christ. Ron, what inspired you to sit down and write your story and have it published? Well, I got to tell you, the one thing is I had a hard time when I came back from the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I really didn't know what to do. So I just focused on exactly what can I do to make a better difference in my own life. Mm -hmm. So I established a very good relationship with the VA, and I went from there. Ron, would you say it's primarily veterans who would be into this book, or do you think there's a wider audience? I think it's possibly two audiences. I am a devout Christian, but at the same time, I had to find my own way with the VA. And the VA is not easy. Mm. The VA is difficult sometimes. So the one thing that every veteran needs to know is that he or she is in charge of their own care. So I really dedicated myself to try and develop how best to take care of myself. When it comes to writing and publishing, was this your first book run? Yes, it's my first book. It took about 10 months for me to write. And I just sat down and I started from day one and I went. Not everybody is incredibly thrilled with what I had to say, you know, but I will tell you, though, that it was the most rewarding thing I've done in my life. Mm. When it came to writing this and then putting it through the publishing process, Ron, what did you find the most challenging part about things? I didn't know where to begin. That's the one thing I did. And I will tell you that Google is an incredible tool. Absolutely. <laughs> so I Googled how to publish your own book, and I just went from there. Of course, it was challenging, and it took me about 10 months to write, but it was incredibly rewarding and um so happy that I did it. You got to tell me about that moment when you finally got that first copy in, Ron, and you finally got to hold your book for the first time. What was that like? Well, when I got that copy in the mail, I cried. I literally cried because I was like, I am a published author now. And I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe that somebody like me could just go about starting from day one and then moving on. I can't tell you how thrilled I was. Mm. Have you given any thought to maybe writing more and publishing more in the future? I have, actually. I had some ideas, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to do mm. because I literally had to sit down and, you know, I type like 70 words a minute. So that wasn't difficult. But I went for 10 months. I didn't want to insult anybody. I didn't want to say anything bad about anybody. I just wanted to talk about my experience. And that was the most thrilling part of it. I have to tell you that 100%. Well, I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way, Ron. Is there anything you could throw out there as advice to the first time aspiring authors? Well, you know what? The one thing I will tell people is don't step away from your ideas. If you have an idea and if you have a story to tell, don't worry about your audience. Don't worry about who's going to read it, who's going to say bad things about it, who's going to say great things about it. Just write it. Do yourself a favor and let your mind go nuts and just write. I know a lot of people are going to find encouragement and hope and help in the pages of this book. Again, the title is Sailing into Salvation. It's written by Ronald Barrett, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can get it everywhere. Go on to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores. You can be able to find it anywhere. Well, Ron, thanks again for coming to the Reader House Author Roundtable and telling me a little bit about your life and about this book. I had a nice time talking. Thanks again. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. 
We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.